Hey, look at this fancy PowerPoint. Whoa. Ooh, didn't someone in here complain like, eh, you got a plain... Jessica? Yeah, was that Jessica? Hey, look, look at my response to the complaint about the last PowerPoint being like plain with no animated slides. And now we have a big fancy warship in the background with like American flag lettering. How about that for a response? So, we're looking at America's path of empire today, and we kind of have to answer this question. And I'm gonna present like six, seven, or even eight reasons of why we joined this imperialist club in the tail end of the 19th century. So let's kind of backtrack first. What is the imperialist club? And who was in the imperialist club? Like who's been the leader of the imperialist club forever? Britain. We knew that Britain was dominating like the entire world with colonies everywhere, right? Give me another country in the imperialist club. Spain, maybe it was, it's now losing. France is expanding. Uh, Germany is expanding. Russia is expanding. So that is your imperialist club we want to play. So we're going to join that club and maybe start your notes by giving me this turning point year when we're officially in. It's 1898. 1898. I would have that kind of front and center in the notes, knowing that I ask you turning point years all the time. 1898, we're officially in. But here's what I would also say. Weren't we always imperialist by nature? Going back to our early colonies and like the expansion westward, taking out Native American tribes, the Pequot War, the Mystic River Massacre, the Anglo-Powhatan Wars. Isn't that, in part, imperialism of, like, flexing our muscles and dominating our influence over others? True, but that's within, like, the same continent. That's within the same continent. But do we ever attack other countries to get their territory? Yeah. Wouldn't that kind of be imperialist? Yeah. What did we do in the 1840s, Ryan? <laughs> did we attack another country in the 1840s to get their land? Did we attack another country in the 1840s to get their land? Yes. Which country? <laughs> that was in the, okay, you're not too far off. In the 1850s, we had a crazy guy actually take over Nicaragua. And try to get it. Yeah, but as like an entire country, do we ever go to war against another country to get their land? Mexico, Polk, the Mexican-American War. We wanted California, they said no, we went to war to take it. Kind of keep that mindset there that we've always kind of done this. So yes, it's recognized that we officially joined the club by 1898, but I'd also present the argument that we've always been that way. Manifest destiny, that's just imperialism by a different name. So think about it that way, and it's going to help you out quite a bit in answering any upcoming questions about imperialism. Now let's knock out our six, seven, eight reasons of why we joined this club. Reason number one, all the cool kids are doing it. We want to play. Everyone is doing it. Look at the Brits. Look at their empire. Look at their tentacles across the globe in Egypt and in India. Look at the Germans. Look at the Brits. Look at the Russians. Everyone's taken their piece of the pie stuff in their grab bag, we want to play as well. What's happening with Africa in the 1800s? Africa's getting split up. Cecil Rhodes, Rhodesia, remember the scramble for Africa or any of that that they taught you last year? What's France doing in Southeast Asia? France is taking over everywhere. In terms of China, you know the story with what the British do with China in the 1800s. Are the Brits dominating the Chinese in the 1800s? Yes. What are, what's the name of the wars? Opium. Opium wars. So just kind of think, that stuff is going on. That's your context. All these other countries are doing it. We want to play. We saw the power. We saw the might. We saw the strength of what all of these countries are doing, so we want to get in that club. So reason number one, peer pressure factor. Everyone else is doing it. Reason number two, money. 
both money kind of from what they have and money for what we can give them. So think of it this way. We might see, uh, I don't know, this little island in the middle of the Pacific and think, whoa, they got some stuff that we can make money from. What might a little island in the middle of the Pacific have? Food, like what type of food? Pineapples or fruit or sugar. And we're like, wait a minute, if we take over that, aren't we then gonna make a bunch of money from that territory? So we start to expand and be it for fruit in Hawaii or bat poo in the Pacific. Yes, I said bat poo or guano. We literally take over islands for their bat poo because it made good fertilizer and you could make a lot of money from it. So think about the resources that they have or the other way to think about it is our companies produce a lot of stuff, right? If we take over another country, guess who they're gonna buy from? Us. So we can sew the world together with a Singer sewing machine. We take over other countries, we'll bring McDonald's to them. And American companies will grow richer. So it's kind of the two front economic argument, right? We're gonna make more money from their resources and they get to buy our stuff. So reason number two, economic. Zero in on the economic a little bit and maybe think tariff policy. This gets a little bit complicated, but I feel like you're with me on it because I've taught you the name of this tariff that has the ripple effects everywhere. McKinley. The McKinley tariff. That McKinley tariff pushes us to expand elsewhere and maybe even take over and annex another country like Hawaii. Remember Hawaii, and the story with Hawaii is kind of complex, but Hawaii was an independent nation with like 100,000 Hawaiians, but 2,000 Americans. Those 2,000 Americans controlled all the sugar plantations, the fruit plantations, and when that McKinley tariff hit, they could no longer sell their stuff to the United States. So they get the idea of simply expanding and taking it over. And I said that you guys could repeat the Hawaii example like a dozen times. We do that elsewhere as well. So the consequences of this really high tariff push us further into the imperialist club. We're gonna get more territory, we're gonna officially make them American territories or American protectorates, terms I'll teach you more in a bit. But you follow me on the business side of things? So we're at what? Reason number one, everyone else is doing it. Reason number two, economic. Reason number three, social Darwinist thinking. Apply kind of the thinking that's going on already in the United States. Social Darwinism, what's another way to simplify that? Social Darwinist thinking. Survival. Of, of the richest? Of, yeah. Yes, but survival of the fittest, we'll say. And the rich are the most fit because they're the toughest. In fact, John D. Rockefeller uses social Darwinist thinking to justify his wealth, saying, well, I'm the most fit to survive. If you're poor on the corner and you're penniless, that's your fault. And Russell Conwell, remember him, he even backs up that argument. So now they're taking the social Darwinist logic to other countries. Like the Indians are not fit to survive, therefore we must conquer them and overtake them. This little old country in the Pacific is not fit enough to survive, therefore the stronger should win. So we've got that mindset that does result in expanding our influence elsewhere. Couple that with this guy's book very influential, definitely racist. You can call it Anglo-Saxonism is the term, but Josiah Strong writes the hierarchy of race, where they actually classify and discuss all of the different races and ethnicities that are out there, and guess which one he says is superior? Us. White Anglo-Saxon where he then takes you through the history of the world and says, well, the white Anglo-Saxon race is dominant and therefore should civilize the planet with their superior ways. And again, you look at some of this stuff today and it's like pretty clearly racist. Even the imagery at the time is definitely racist, but they consider it kind of the white man's burden to bring their civilization to, they even use the term of like savages of people elsewhere who are not yet civilized. And this becomes the dominant mindset of the American government. Guess which people are dominating the American government in the 1880s, 1890s? 
white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. So they feel they're superior. And what are we doing within our borders if you're not white Anglo-Saxon? How are African Americans treated? Asians. They're, they're, not, they're banned. So they believe that Anglo-Saxonism is superior and they should civilize the rest of the world. Definitely racist, not really humanitarian as they depict the other races or other groups with horrible stereotypes, as you can see. But there's Uncle Sam, who's taken them up this rocky path to civilization. This guy, by the way, would be the Brits. That's John the Bull. Right so they're doing it as well. The Anglo-Saxons, they're going up this path of ignorance and vice and brutality and slavery and cannibalism eventually to civilization. So that's another one of the mindsets that's out there. There's the social Darwinism and the Anglo-Saxonism. You got that? We also have military interests. This is two more. Military interests will push us to expand because as our military expands, we need bases. Like in the middle of the Pacific, we might need a key fueling station or a naval base for repair. In the middle of the Pacific, hmm, we end up getting one of our key naval bases in Hawaii. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. We need Pearl Harbor, we need one in Wake Island, we need one in Midway. And basically as we expand, we see the advantage for the military of getting bases everywhere. So that's going to push us further into this expansion game, the military benefits. In addition, this guy's book, it is so influential. Alfred Thayer Mahan writes The Influence of Sea Power on History from 1660 to 1783. He argues that if you're going to be a strong nation, you need a strong navy. So that's his thesis. Let me ask you the question, do we take his advice? Do we have a strong navy? Do we have a strong navy? Yes. yes. A definitive yes. In fact, if you just take our Navy out of our military, get this, our Navy would be the second strongest military in the world. You follow me of what I'm saying? So the number one military in the entire world is the United States, right? If you take our military out, or if you take our Navy out, that alone would be the second largest military in the world. That's how powerful our Navy is today. You follow what I'm saying? So more powerful than every other country, we spend a lot on our military, we still spend a ton on our Navy, we've listened to this guy's advice. So he argues if you want to be dominant, you need a strong Navy, but if you need a strong Navy and have a strong Navy, you need bases everywhere. Yes? In addition, we've got this idea of jingoism. You know what a jingo is, or have you ever heard the term jingoism? It's almost fanatical patriotism, the way that I would describe it. So like patriotism, we're like, you know, proud to be American type thing. You pledge allegiance to the flag. So take like the patriotism times a thousand, where you are so fanatically proud to be American, if someone even looks at your country the wrong way, you will go to war with them. So it's like this fanatical, over-the-top patriotism is how I would describe jingoism. And sure enough, we get a couple of notable jingos in our government that threaten everyone with war all of the time over non-issues. People might just bash the United States, we're gonna go to war with you. You might look at us the wrong way, we're gonna go to war with you. Our Secretary of State, Richard Olney, was a jingo. And this notable guy, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, that's Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt is a fighter. Teddy Roosevelt loves war. Teddy Roosevelt, when president, would actually host boxing matches in the White House. And he would box. He's a fighter. When we go to war in 1898 against uh, Spain, he quits his post and volunteers to fight. He's the epitome of a jingo. But these jingos almost get us in 10 different wars in the 1890s over like non-issues. Like, I can't even tell you what starts it, but we, like, threaten Germany with war. We threaten another country with war. So these guys are, like, putting up their dukes. They are ready to fight. 
and then we bring something back with a little boundary issue between Venezuela and British Guyana. So just think South America. There's a little sliver of land that sure enough, they had gold on it. So it's between those two countries and you know what those in British Guyana said? They said, that's our land. Oh no. And in the past, we wouldn't have even batted our eye at this, but now we bring back something that we issued in the 1820s that was previously ignored. The Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine closed the Americas to colonization. So we interpret this little land dispute and the Brits trying to take that little sliver of land. We say, hey, violation of the Monroe Doctrine. You can't do that. We flex our muscles. We threaten the Brits. They back down. That's jingoism. So we're willing to take over over anything. We're willing to go to war over anything. And our willingness to go to war ultimately gets us involved in a big old war with Spain. You know what we acquire from Spain in 1898? Territories we still have today, Puerto Rico and Guam. We also got the Philippines, but we gave that their independence in 1945. More on that later. So anyway, that's going to push us into the fight. Oh, I have more reasons. Oh yeah, there's, look, Uncle Sam doing his thing. He's awkwardly fighting. He's got his hat and jacket off. Oh yeah, he's ready to fight. He is threatening the Brits. Did we ever threaten Japan? Yeah, when we sent the um, Matt O'Perry. When we sent Matthew Perry over there in the 1850s. Trade with us or else. Trade with us or else. So we're putting, putting kind of our dukes up, you could say. We also have the kind of religious missionary thing that's pushing us to expand elsewhere. And this one's kind of weird to understand. Where again, understand that missionaries are going around the globe still today, right? You got missionaries in South America, in Africa, you name it, the missionaries go. But oftentimes when the missionaries are there, they'll like write a letter home. They're like, hey everyone, this place is nice. They have some farms, the soil is very fertile. There's people making money and it's like, wait, I can make money over there as well. So the missionary motive is pious, you could say. These missionaries are being like carried around by Chinese people, kind of oddly. But sometimes when they write letters home, the country follows. And that's what happened with a lot of this. The missionaries went, they write letters home. A couple generations later, it's like, oh, well now there's Uncle Sam, now there's John Bull, now there's Germany. Everyone else is following because they now want that land. Does everyone else eventually get involved in China? Yep. Yep, the United States included. We carve out part of China for ourselves in one of these spheres of influence, as it will later be known. So just kind of understand, it might start in this simple, pious way, but the end result might be everyone else is coming. How many reasons have I given you so far? Five. Here's another. In fact, it's my final reason. I think if you're counting, it should be number eight of reasons we're joining that imperialist club. But do you remember the thesis of Frederick Jackson Turner? Frederick Jackson Turner said we need what to relieve the pressure? Frontier. A safety valve, good. So we need the frontier. We need the frontier as a safety valve. But oh no, 1890, that frontier is closed. Without that safety valve, we're going to bottle up and explode, right? We just look elsewhere. We just look abroad. We look to you know, the Pacific, we look, uh, you know, to another country, and we can release that safety valve that way. And coincidentally, this is in the 1890s, when do we start to assert ourselves abroad? In the 1890s. Kind of makes sense? Now think of it this way. Let's say in two weeks, I know you're looking forward to this one, this Thursday is your midterm, the following Thursday is your essay. And if you pull out the imperialism question, remember your opening paragraph, you set the stage, you go well before the 1890s to tell me the story of imperialism. What are a couple things that you could write about? Context of the US flexing its muscles to get what it wants. Context of the US going to war to take territory. Write about Matthew Perry, that's one example. But what did we even want whenever we went over? We want to trade with Japan. And if they weren't if they weren't Japan gonna trade with us, we're gonna to go to war with them. Right before that, Japan. 
Yeah, Japan wouldn't trade with anyone, and think of Japan as the gateway to all of Asia. You need to trade with Japan first, and then you have access everywhere. So that's a perfect example of early imperialism. Trade with us or else. What's another example that you could detail? Mexican-American War. That would be perfect uh, you know, context for imperialism, how we've always done it. We tried to buy what from Mexico? California. And they said no. We then instigate the war by marching south until they shoot at us, and Polk says American blood on American soil. You could use that. You could use any of the Native American examples. I think that you'd be pretty good. Good? Yeah. Okay. We'll cover this stuff tomorrow. i got to give you closing questions, and then we're zeroing in on number four today. I'll show you once you all get it. And I'm going to give you a hint of what I'm looking for, but I don't think I'm going to tell you. So number one, number two, number three, you can do with relative ease. Number four is kind of our challenging question, but it's the most important on this list. It says, how does imperialism fit with American ideals of self-determination, freedom, and equality? Like, that's kind of what our nation's founded upon, right? Self-determination, freedom, equality. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That's our nation's core. That's what we're founded upon, right? Why did we break from Britain? Because they were violating those things. They were not allowing us to determine our fate. They were not giving us freedom. They were not acknowledging our equality. So we wrote that pointed letter Declaration of Independence about King George violating all of our rights. What are we now doing to other countries? What's the key word? It starts with a letter H that I feel hypocritical. I think you should kind of use that in your answer, where it's a little bit hypocritical that we're now taking over other countries. Don't these other countries want to determine their own fate? Don't these other countries want like freedom and life and liberty and pursuit of happiness? Do they want us to be there? No. You'll see that not all of them do want us to be there. Not all of them want to be civilized. So just understand that there's a counter argument to this mighty American imperialism thing where not everyone wants to be taken over. Think about that as you go. Number five, I didn't get you there yet. You might know some of it, uh, but I'll explain it in full tomorrow and we'll continue the fun as we go throughout the week. Sound good? Yeah. Who's staying with me during block? Molly, you are? No, I have, I have a pickup.